Good morning. As you can tell by the, the purple everywhere, we are in Lent. We started on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. It was a great service, great turnout, great to have so many people participating in, in all three of our services, including our family chapel. So it was a great day here at Bethel. And we continue with our series on the I Am Statements of Jesus. Today we'll be looking at Jesus as the bread of life. What is Jesus telling the crowd uh, some 2,000 years ago, and what is he telling us today when he compares himself to the, the very bread of life, and it is super appropriate that we're doing that on a day where we are taking communion and participating in the very bread of life. So again, it's so great um, to have you all here. It is definitely Texas in February because the weather does not know what it's doing. It, um, so just every day, just kind of wake up and hope. It could be rain, it could be snow, it could be cold, it could be warm, um, and we, we move on. So uh, it is great to have you here, whether you're participating online or in person. Uh, it's so great to be in the house of God. It's so great to see God's continued work around in us and through us here at Bethel. I ask you to stand uh, for our opening hymn, number 798, The God of Abraham Prays. <laughs> Lit is a season of penitence. It's a season of some people go without something. Some people give something up. Some people 
is expressed in many different ways. Um, we don't say the word hallelujah, for example. So during confession and absolution, I think we, we take a special moment during Lent to acknowledge our own brokenness in the world. And, and the brokenness not only in the world, but our own personal brokenness. That, that we, we are on a journey to a cross. We're, we're in part responsible for that journey. And yet the journey doesn't end at a cross. It ends in a celebration. But in the meantime, we are journeying to a cross. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you by our thoughts, words, and deeds. Wherever we, wherefore we flee to refuge in your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, merciful God. Who has given your only begotten Son to die for us? Have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of our sins, and by your Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment to reflect on that. Friends, have good news. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and he has given his only Son to die for us. For his sake he forgives all of our sins, to they, those who believe on his name, he gives us the power to be the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. We continue with our psalm, which is Psalm number 105, which will be read responsibly. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold, and there was none among his tribes who stumbled. He spread a cloud for a living covering and fire to give light by night. They asked and you brought quail and gave them bread from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock. The water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. The Lord be with you. We pray together. O Lord, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior 
we may walk through the wilderness of this world, through the glory of the world to come, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Having been reconciled to God through the confession and absolution, now we show our reconciliation towards each other in the sharing of the peace. Greetings. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Exodus, starting with the 16th chapter. They set out from Elam. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know what it is that the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and, then, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to be full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 5, starting at the 12th verse. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, 
that sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abundant for, abound, abound for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is the word of the Lord.
The bread of life. I am the bread of life. Grace, mercy, and peace be from God our Father. As we meditate on his word and may this meditation be pleasing in his sight and comforting to us. Amen. Amen. Slice or loaf of bread. Just look at that. A simple loaf of bread. Just think about the smell of a freshly baked loaf of bread. When I was in high school, I worked at Albertsons, and we would always, those of us that, that gathered the carts in the parking lot, would always rush over to the bakery area when the fresh bread came out, hoping to get a free slice. But yeah, it's the smell. There's nothing like better than this. Like going into a bakery, just the smell of a fresh loaf of bread. That, 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 that makes you, if you can't be happy then, you know, just, there's something just very basic about a simple loaf of bread. Actually, is there anything more basic and yet essential than a loaf of bread? Is there anything in our world, in our society, that, that is more kind of essential to who we are as substance? And it just kind of, the, the whole idea that the metaphor of breaking bread means gathering, right, around people. Not, not just in the communion sense, but just in, 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 a, in a wider metaphor. To break bread means what? To gather around friends and have a meal. You know, talking about, you know, man cannot live on bread alone. Like bread, any reference to food in a, in a general sense or substance in a general sense always comes back to bread. A simple loaf of bread. In fact, people that have studied this, you know, archaeologists and, and historians and, and whatnot, many people believe that the ability to make bread is what allowed civilizations to exist. Have you ever heard this theory? The, 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 the idea that once people realize if you, you know, combine the ingredients and yeast and all that together to make bread, that once you could, once you could have a substantive, reliable food, or in its liquid form, beer, that's what caused people to, humans, is you know, in, in their evolution, in the, in, the, in the micro sense, to stop being hunter-gatherers and start developing civilizations. That, that the, the ability to consistently make bread, because it's the, the ingredients for it are pretty simple. The things, what, what you need to make bread can grow in, in a variety of, of circumstances, in a variety of environments. That the ability to make bread is pretty much what, and you look at the cradle of civilization, what they, the parts of the world where they say civilization started, and it's places where they learn to cultivate bread. So bread is the very thing that likely, well, this is not 100% sure, but likely allowed humans to, to stop being hunter-gatherers and start living in tribes and civilizations and towns and villages and eventually cities. Think about that. One little, like, a bread did that. But, Sliced bread. That's the real game changer. Anybody have any idea when sliced bread was invented? I researched this this week. These are, the, these are the things they pay you to do as a pastor is research sliced bread. It was about 100 years ago, in the 1920s, is when sliced bread came out as a thing. But I ask you this question about sliced bread. So what was the best thing before sliced bread? That's, that's way funnier than that. Come on, people. <laughs> you heard the saying, right? Do I need to explain this to you? Okay, there's a saying, the best thing since life, sliced bread. So the joke is, what was the best thing before sliced bread? Now laugh. Okay, yeah. You got a rough crowd today. What was the best thing before sliced bread? If bread is the best thing, or, the, or, 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 or this essential thing, and we say, you know, the old saying, they're the best thing since sliced bread, what was the best thing before sliced bread? But I can't imagine, can you imagine life without sliced bread? It, 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 is a, it is a fair question, you know, like, make toast, I mean, like, like there, I guess before sliced bread, people had to slice their own loaf, and to make a sandwich, I, I don't know, I, I, I kind of... When you think about it, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing. But let's not get too distracted here. 
What was the best thing since sliced bread? Jesus claimed, I am the bread of life. So what does that really mean? What is he claiming here? And we get a little bit of a hint of that in our, in our two of our three previous readings. The Old Testament reading, the whole story of the manna from heaven, the bread from heaven, that's referenced to in the psalm as well. This would have been a big part. You know, every culture, every society has kind of their stories that they tell. You know, as, as, as Texans, right? It's, you know, the Alamo. Remember the Alamo and, and the stories of Davy Crockett and all that, you know? For, for Americans, it's, you know, it's, you know, George Washington wouldn't chop down, you know, wouldn't, you know, the apple tree. We have these legends that, that, that make us kind of who we are, these stories. And a lot of times they're kind of half fiction, half fact, kind of, they're legends. But and in the Jewish tradition, they, one of their stories, and I wouldn't call it a legend in the sense that we believe it was true, but, but it kind of reached legend status was this manna from heaven. We were in the wilderness. We had no food to eat. We were grumbling. They were even, even begging to go back home to Egypt where, yes, we were slaves, but at least we had food. You know, they were petty in that way. And every day for however many days it was, manna, this bread, this, this came down, this bread from heaven came down and fed us. So, this idea of receiving bread from heaven was in the DNA of the culture of what it meant to be a Jewish person by the time Jesus came around. So this is, this is appealing. This whole bread of life thing is appealing to the very essence of what it meant to be a part of this, this group that was brought out of Egypt into the promised land and sustained by this bread of heaven. So that's in a way, what Jesus is appealing to, and you can't read this text that we're about to read and not have that story of the bread from heaven in the back of your mind. But now we can read this story, so let's go ahead and rise. For the reading of the gospel, which is found from John chapter 6, the actual um, text on the bread of life is, is many more verses than we're going to deal with in Day, but it's, it, it, if you go to the Bible studies, you may get dig, deal in those a little bit more. But it, it's, a, it's quite a long section. Um, we're going to start with the 35th verse. And note that he's going to claim this twice. He's going to actually say the phrase, I am the bread of life, twice in this text. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And the will of him who sent me is that I should lose nothing that he has given me, but raise it on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone looks upon the Son and believes shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him. Just like the Jews who grumbled in the wilderness. They grumbled again. Because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. Think about that story of the manna in the back of their ground, in the back of their heads. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how does he say now, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written the prophets, and they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and not learned of the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that, came, that comes down from heaven, so that I may eat of it, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am, I am, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread... 
he will live together. And this bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. All right, in order to get a full context here, Jesus is pulling together several big events. One is obviously this whole idea of the manna in the the desert and the wilderness, even calling that the bread from heaven and then calling himself the bread of heaven. But you need to back up a few verses in this chapter to really get a full context here. So if you back up, for example, to John chapter 6, verse 1, it's the feeding of the 5,000. It's that miracle. Now, what does Jesus do in the feeding of the 5,000? He takes a few loaves of bread and does what? He breaks it, he breaks it, he breaks it, he multiplies it and feeds a a, a crowd of, it says 5,000 men, so we have no idea what the the, the true count was, but an, an impressive amount of people ate off of a few loaves of bread. And then he walks on water, and then the, some of that crowd remains on the other side of the sea, and, they, and then and he, when he comes back to, the, to that side, they're still waiting for him. Now, I, I don't think it's the whole crowd, but there's a remnant of this, this crowd of the 5,000 that, that witnessed the, the miraculous feeding of Jesus from the loaves of the 5,000, and they're waiting for him. Are they waiting for another, the show? Are they waiting for more teaching? What, what, what are they waiting for is the, is the question, but they're waiting for him. And then that's the context him, and they, and they start asking him questions. He says, when did you come here? And then they start asking him all these questions, and then they, they go back and forth on this whole idea of bread of life. And then they said, give us this bread. He, he talks about, I have this eternal bread. And he goes, give us this bread always, like, you're, t- you're trying to tell us, like, you even got a better bread than the bread you just gave us a couple days ago when you fed the 5,000 of us through, through the, the miraculous just breaking of the bread? And, and Jesus is using this, this, this earthly miracle that he did to, to multiply bread to point them to something even greater. So he's pulling these, these two events together, the manna in heaven and the, the breaking of the bread and, and, and the feeding of the 5,000 to set up this teaching on him as the bread of life. You see, because the crowd, even though they had witnessed a miracle feeding, even though they had seen Jesus take these few loaves of bread and feed the whole crowd, they were still not convinced about Jesus. They wanted more. They wanted more miracles. They wanted more proof. They wanted more Maybe more, it's more of the show that they, they wanted. They wanted more. They were not satisfied with what he had given them. And so that, that's what sets up this whole conversation. And then that's where he goes into them and says, look, I am the bread of life. The, the bread of life that you are looking for. They ask him the question, sir, give us this bread always. And he says, look, I am this bread. You already have it. You you know, believing in me is what gives you this bread. But they they, they still want more. They they, they can't understand that. They they keep asking for more explanation. And he says, look, if you want to come to the Father, it's through me because I am this bread. And this bread is what allows you to connect to the Father. And it's the will of the Father that whoever looks on the Son, me, believes in him, shall be raised on the last day. So this bread is the substance that that brings you to the last day and into eternal life. So, but yet they still don't get it. They grumble. And then they grumble because he says he is the bread that comes down from heaven. Now, in the back of this audience's mind, what is the bread that comes down from heaven? It was the manna in the desert. So when Jesus says, I am the bread that comes down from heaven, he's comparing himself to this gift from God that came down to heaven to be their substance. And they they asked for more, and he gave them more, (laughs) but not the more they wanted. 
See, they always wanted more. They weren't satisfied with what Jesus was giving them. They wanted more. Yet, are we that different? We have the same problem today. We always seem to want more. Whatever God does for us, whatever Jesus does for us, whatever we get from this world, we always seem to want more. More money, more status, more security, more sense of progress, more justice, more whatever. We, just like the Jewish crowd here, who struggled to be content with what Jesus was telling them, by saying, I am the very bread of life. They wanted more from Jesus. And we want more from God, too. And I think a lot of people who walk away from the faith or walk away from church or walk away from as active of a role in, in the faith is because they all, they're just in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sense of our, all of our back of our mind is there is, this is great, but isn't there more? And let's be honest, that something as simple as bread leaves us a little wanting more. Like, well, bread's great, but can we get a little jelly with our bread? Can we get, you know, if you only ate bread, that'd be kind of a boring life. So we, 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 there's a sense in us that we always want more. And that's what Jesus is appealing to, because can, can the simple bread of life be sufficient for you? Can that be enough substance for us? Or do we need more? So then Jesus offered them the bread of life, even better than the manna in the desert, eternal living food that never spoils. So again, Jesus is, is taking these two events, the feeding of the 5,000, the manna in the desert, and tying them together and saying, I am the fulfillment of all of this. The man in the desert actually was pointing to me as the bread of life. The feeding of the 5,000 was actually pointing to me as the bread of life. And it says, so he says this, he says, do not grumble. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. So I will raise him up on the last day. It is written and they will be taught by God Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. You see, he's saying, I am even better than manna. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna and the wilderness. So again, he's tying himself back to that. Your fathers ate that, and guess what? They still eventually died. The man in the wilderness subsided them for a few weeks, days, months, years, whatever. But eventually they got old and died too. You see, the, I think the part of the problem that we we'll look, look, look back at the, what I shared before, that they wanted more is they got so caught up in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 that they saw that as this great event that happened but it, it, it shifted their focus on earthly things God, Jesus, do another show that was great that you fed the 5,000, what are you going to do next and we see this throughout Jesus' life, when he does these miracles when he heals someone, when he, when he even when he raises Lazarus from the dead when he, you know, walks on water, when, when, he, when, he, when, he, when he stops the storms when he, when he especially the, his healing ministries but in, in the Gospels, that you get this, this sense that at some point Jesus kind of backs off the miracles. And it even says, I think it's in Luke, that he, he, back, he stopped doing as many miracles because the people started coming for the show. Right? They just came to be entertained. And he started focusing more on teaching. So we kind of see this shift. And especially in Luke is the most pronounced where he really goes, starts going into the parables a lot. But... The whole idea here is that people, they, they see the miracle, and the miracle is there to point them to Jesus as the source of this bread of life, but they, can't, they, they come just wanting another miracle. 
wanting, wanting some, some kind of earthly show, something that's going to sustain them here on earth. And he's trying to point them to something deeper, something eternal, something spiritual, something that's going to not just feed their, their belly, but feed their very soul. And I think that's the same struggle we have, too, is right? We want to, the next big thing to happen. We want the next impressive thing to happen. And yet, Jesus is saying, these things are great, right? But I, I want to give you something that's eternal. I want to give you something that's even better than the man in the desert. I want to give you eternal living food that never spoils. And we have a hard time being content with something that's eternal because so much of our time and, and our life here on earth is spent on the, well, I got to pay my mortgage this month and I got to do this and I got to do that. And then all those things are great and important and they're part of life, but we get so easily distracted by the day to day that we lose sight of this eternal food, this, that God is not only wanting to sustain us, give us our daily bread, he's also wanting to give us eternal life. And that's what the bread of life is pointing to us. You see, Jesus offers this living bread to sustain us as well. And that living bread is even better than sliced bread. And it was there a long time before sliced bread as well. You see, if we only spiritualize this bread of life and just kind of say this is this cerebral thing that Jesus does is to say I'm, I'm this bread of life, and, but, but lose sight of it, it has both a now happening right in front of us reality, come taste and eat, take and eat, this is my body, but also has this eternal function of connecting us to the resurrection, connecting us to when, when Jesus says right here, when, when I return, it's a both and reality. So he offers us this living bread, not only to sustain us while we're here on earth, to spiritually feed us and get us through the next challenge, the next difficulty, the next obstacle in our life, the next season of brokenness, the next loss of a loved one, whatever it is that we're going through that is challenging us, he also gives it to us as our hope of a eternal future, a bread that never spoils, food for our soul. And that is even better than sliced bread. Because Jesus said, what I am, the bread of life. He says, I love this last little phrase, the last few verses of this. I'm going to read it one more time. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So and, and think about it once again. Living bread, they would have heard that and they would have immediately triggered this, this idea of manna. So he said, I am manna, I am better than that. If anyone eats of this bread, he will what? Live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is what? My flesh. Come, taste and eat. Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for us. So when we come to that table here in a few minutes to receive a little wafer, it doesn't seem like it would sustain us very long if we were relying on that for, for true food. But what it does for our soul, what it does for our spirit, what it, what it does to, to sustain us spiritually. I see it so many times when I'm giving communion and to see people receive that wafer and it just, it, it just he, the healing power of that. When I do shut-in visits or whatever, it's that people know that they are connecting to Jesus in a real tangible way. We don't know how it all works. We're not trying to, to over-explain it, but just know that somehow or another, when we take that bread, when we drink that wine... We are connecting with Jesus in a real practical way. The living Jesus who still comes to us in that meal. Because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am 
the living bread. I am the bread that comes from heaven. Part of this, this bread then is, this, it, it, it is substance, right? Bread at its core, what it is, it, it, it is unless, unless you have, unless you're you know, not able to eat bread because you know, of whatever. But for most people, bread is, is a core part of, of what sustains them, of substance. A couple weeks ago, we looked at when Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, I am the light of the world, right? You are the light of the world. You are, you know, he talks about how you are the salt of the earth. I think part of him talking about this bread of heaven is the same, is the same message, right? That it's this thing that sustains the world. So with that in mind, I think we, we end this sermon with, we end this thought with, who can we be sharing this living bread who is rely, who, who in our lives, who in our society, who in our community, who amongst us that we work with, that we live next to, that we interact with on a, on a regular basis are relying just on bread from this world to sustain them and know nothing about the living bread or walked away from the living bread or never fully understood the living bread. Last week I asked you to Consider people in your life that are difficult to love, and I hope that you were able to pray that God would bless them as a challenge. But also, I want you to think about, that's what we are here for. If we're not here for anything else as Bethel Lutheran Church on Northwest Highway, it's to let people know that this living bread, the Word of God, the Son of God, is available to them. And as it sustains us, week in and week out, year in and year out, decade and decade out, for the last 70 years as Bethel Lutheran Church, we share it with our community. We do it in, in formal ways, like being mentors at a local elementary school, or volunteering at White Rock Center of Hope, and, and different family chapel activities like that. We also do it in less formal ways, with the when we gather with friends to break bread and point them to this bread of life. You see, because Jesus says the bread of life is even better than sliced bread. Amen? We stand, we confess our common faith in the words of the creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance of the Father, by whom all things were made, for who us, man, and for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He was suffered and buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, from whom again with glory to judge both the living and the dead kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the offertory.
stand for prayer. Some of the people that we continue to pray for, and obviously you'll have people on your own prayer list, those that, that we, 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 we wrestle with and think about, you know, who, who needs this bread of life? Who needs this substance in their life? Uh, but we, we bring attention to the, the ones that are on our list. One update from the, from the prayer list is uh, John Cook did pass on Thursday. His service will be here at Bethel on Saturday, March 11th, and more details about that to come. And it's great to have you here with us, Ona, today um, during this sad time in your life. Um, and then we, we also pray for all who are healing or seeking healing or just struggling in, in many ways, Lord. And uh, we, we, we recognize that the, the suffering, and I think if anything, during Lent, we were more sensitive to the suffering of the world. And it's been one year uh, this weekend since the beginning of the, uh, of the conflict in the Ukraine. So we keep that in our minds as well. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we lift up those who suffer, Lord, during this season of Lent. We're mindful of the suffering of the world. We're mindful that you are best seen in suffering. That the suffering you did on our behalf to go to a cross is the very suffering that we also are aware of and, and partake in, and suffering is real. So we, we pray for those who suffer, Lord. We pray that those who suffer will, will in some way or another be connected and, and, and touched by your bread of life. Uh, we, we pray for the life of John, and, and we pray for Ona and Phil and the family as they mourn that loss, and we prepare for a, a celebration of life in a couple weeks. Uh, Lord, we pray for, uh, for the healing and, and for the peace uh, for Rosemary, for Judy, for Ruth, uh, for Cindy, for Donna, and for Rhonda. We pray, Lord, for Larry, for Karen, for Ann, for Olivia, for Marilyn, for David, for Kenneth, for Ruth, for Sean and those that we name in our hearts at this time. Father God, you are the great I am. And you send your son to us who claims that I am for himself today in the, in the bread of life. And as we get ready to come to the table and receive this living bread, may it nourish us this day and beyond. Amen. Amen. We continue with the service of the communion just a reminder that the responses are sung the lord be with you lift up your hearts let us give thanks unto the lord our god It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many that with cleansed hearts <coughs> we may be prepared to joyfully celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, the entire company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying, by you we are bold to pray together our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses 
and we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It was on the night of his betrayal that the, the very one who claimed to be the bread of life shared bread with his disciples. He broke it. He gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup, Having given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of all of you. This cup is the new covenant of my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you eat and drink this meal in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
stand. So reminded that the, the responses are sung. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us the same in faith towards you and fervent love towards one another through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious upon to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen. Closing hymn is number 424, O Christ, you walk the road.
may be seated. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, one, uh, the I Am studies start now with Dell right after this service. Uh, we're also going to have them throughout the week, and the leaders of those are listed in the bulletin and the times. And uh, I will uh, be leaving my group. Uh, anybody can come. You don't have to be a member of the Elks Lodge on on Wednesdays at seven, which will kind of meet right after the the services. Uh, the services will be starting this Wednesday, every Wednesday during Lent up until the week of Holy Week, with Ash, obviously with Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. will be uh, at noon and 6. It will be noon prayer and, and an evening prayer with a, with, a, with a brief message that will be on one of the alternate texts. So, for example, this Wednesday it will be on the man in the desert. So it will be something that's tied to the, the, the I am statement that we are going to have there. Uh, I guess I don't know if it's good news or bad news, but we don't. We, you don't have to come back for a voters' meeting because we we have people that understand the the bylaws and constitution a lot better than me, and a lot better. So they 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 really, since the person that we're bringing up forward to be the treasurer is already a member of council, that the council can deal with that. So uh, you guys can uh, continue your lives without that as without without a voters' meeting, uh, which is I guess I guess good news. Good news for people that, that had plans this afternoon, I guess. Anyway, so, but thank you again for being here today. Uh, more coming up. And one, just one quick announcement um, regarding the, the, the strategic planning committee. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, a team of seven people. Those names have been announced. And, and, the, and the priorities for the goals and objectives have been announced, and we'll keep those in front of you. We are targeting no later than uh, Palm Sunday to kind of announce the, the initial findings of that group. So uh, just be patient. Keep that group in your prayers. Uh, we're looking at a lot of different um, aspects of, of Bethel and how we can can uh, fulfill the uh, the work that the, the, the group that gathered for that Saturday, which was, you know, well over 25 people to to come up with goals and objectives for the next uh, five, three to five years of Bethel. So that will be coming, um, you know, I said no later than Palm Sunday uh, for that. So keep that group in your prayers. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.